This is Control Structure, episode 123, for February 23rd, 2017. This podcast, people, I gotta tell you, this podcast is rigged. This show has notes. Visit thenexus.tv slash cs123 to see them. I am your host, President Donald Trump, and with me today is the miraculous Andrew Bailey. Hi! And with me today is the wonderful Stephen Orifice. Hello. I'm pretty sure that did not get me on any kind of list. Nah. <laughs> it, it, I, I, was, I knew you were going for something there at first, but I just couldn't quite get it. Yeah. Uh, but it, it, it does sound pretty good, though, now that you yeah, uh, it, that it, I know it's supposed it, to be. It, it takes a while for it to warm up. <laughs> Very nice. So, uh, yeah, it's been uh, pretty nice out, uh, if you haven't noticed. It fact, has been. In fact, it has been so nice this week that I have not driven my car since Sunday. So, That's... like, I've just been, you know, using the tea to go to work and stuff. So, in fact, it was so warm today that I wore uh, short sleeves and shorts, uh, even to work. I even saw it today, uh, I was out in our yard, and I noticed that we had a flower poking up, up from the ground. So apparently it thinks it's time to come up. <laughs> Surprise next week! <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, let's see, aside from that, uh, yeah, been playing lots of Fallout 4, so, uh, you know, still playing the, uh, was it the survival mode? Um, let's see, then, uh, still cool enough, uh, that I, you know, still using the bike in the basement, so. You're, you're keeping your, your muscles up so the summertime are hitting, you're just gonna do, like, 30 miles in one day. Uh, something like that. Okay. I'm actually surprised you didn't have it out, because it, it has been warm enough to have come out. Yeah, it, you know, once it gets below 70, it's kind of iffy. So, uh, yeah, that's true. It's been borderline. Yeah, it's it really hasn't gone up b- above like sixty five or anything. So, uh, anyways, uh, speaking about Trump, uh, we haven't talked about him a little bit, which is fine because everyone else is talking about him. Uh, but he made some very specific promises during his campaign, and he hasn't wasted much time in getting things done. So here are some lists. Uh, to, you know, pretty much check off as he does things or not. So, uh, the one, the one thing that, uh, uh, I think, yeah, one of his broken promises is, uh, don't take a vacation. Yeah, I was, it was interesting that, uh, that one was there that he did, but then I remembered who it was. And then I read another promise of, I won't use Twitter, that's not presidential. And I was like, uh huh, yes. Yeah, <laughs> he pretty much blew that one. Uh, uh yeah the uh <laughs> you know when uh you know it yeah it was before the inauguration that he said uh, being president is hard work I was like well no crap I will be uh watching these there's uh, I actually got two of them here let's go into some news so uh we've been talking about AMD Ryzen for a little bit uh for the past maybe two episodes or so. So the uh, review embargo lifts on the 28th, followed by full release on March 2nd. And pre-orders are open now. Uh, So I've actually been uh, to Newegg, and the the top-of-the-line Ryzen 7 1800X is already out of stock. That was Uh, pretty fast. You know when uh, they put put it online on Newegg? Uh, I checked uh, earlier today, and it was not there. Okay, wow, so they, they sold out. That'll be interesting to see numbers and how many they sell in and things like that. Yeah, So, and I just refreshed the page. I'm sorting by uh, price, and now it's not even on the product page, <laughs> on the category page. It's, it's insane. So, uh, yeah, there is a lot of demand for this. Uh, like, you wouldn't think that a $500 CPU would just fly off the shelves, but there you go. Yeah. Um, so, 
uh, AMD had a little press conference last night, and uh, you know, pretty much you know, going over a little bit more stuff about it, um, like uh, clock speeds. Uh, so uh, some uh, some benchmarks have been released as well, uh, showing that it's pretty much, if not beating uh, the 6900X uh, Intel chip. If it's not, you know, uh, beating it, it's matching it. So, um, let's see, then another thing that uh, AMD uh, was really surprised with is that, you know, they wanted a 40% uh, uh, IPC improvement over their previous uh, chip. Like, well, they got to like 52% or so. <laughs> that's, that's pretty good. So, you know, like I mentioned on like a maybe last episode that uh, they had some... Uh, bug that was eating up a lot of their uh, performance potential, and it seems like they've alleviated that quite a bit. So uh, definitely a good thing. So that are uh, put a lot of pressure on Intel now. They they might uh, have to step up and come up with something new for themselves. Um, well, maybe not have to step up. Maybe step down their prices. That that could be a good one too. Because like that uh, was it that sixty nine hundred X chip. Or that 6900K or whatever uh, mm-hmm. is a thousand dollar chip, and a five hundred dollar one is beating it. So for comparison, as we look at that that 3D Mark file Fire Strike physics card uh, on that page, there it has a few different i7s. Are there any of the i7s in that five hundred dollar range that you know off the top of your head? Uh, let's see, CPU Mark. Let's see, uh, which page are you looking on again? Uh, the WCCFTech.com one. There's like so many here. Uh, maybe maybe I have to turn on uh, JavaScript for a second. <laughs> <laughs> that first one in that slideshow they have there. Uh, let's see. Da-da-da. Yeah, looks like that table there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, apparently that's just an engineering sample, so, you know, like who knows about that. Okay, so it's not really a good fair uh, yeah. look then. So, uh, yeah, the 6900K is the thousand dollar one. The 5960X, I think, was maybe the previous generation. That's still like over 500. Okay. And the 6800K, I want to say, is maybe a 400 dollar CPU. I'm not sure. All I know is like the 6700 and the 7700 are like 350 dollars. So, like, the 700 CPUs are, you know, 300 to 400 or so. Okay. So they're uh, definitely, definitely uh, well, well ahead price-wise. Yeah. So, which is, uh, you know, definitely something that they've been needing for uh, several years now. That little bit of competition. Yeah. So, and uh, we got some pictures of the uh, CPU up close. And, uh, you know not only the box but also the chip itself and it looks like the integrated heat spreaders you know have a very uh obvious ryzen uh mark on them so you know uh again i'm sort of disappointed in amd that they still have pins on their cpu Mm. yeah because pins are very uh easy to bend and break and yeah and uh cpus cost more than motherboards so do you is the tech <laughs> is the, the the method that Intel uses uh, to be pinless? Uh, is that patented in some way, or is it simple enough that probably they could use it if they wanted to? From what I can gather, uh, you know what AMD Opterons are. They're, it's their server CPUs, and okay. from what I can tell, some Opterons are pinless. Okay, so just, it's not like they can't do it. Yeah, it's just that they've chosen not to for some reason. Very interesting. So, um, yeah, so if this holds up uh, for the benchmarks for real, uh, I'm going to be getting one of these. Uh, and if AMD Vega is just as good, I'm going to be lining up for that one too. Uh, virtually, of course. Uh, so if I'm going to do that, I'm going to need some benchmarks to run. Uh, so, uh, you know, I was sort of looking around, uh, with benchmarks and I'm thinking, it's like, well, since my current, uh, desktop is going to be transitioning to my server, 
Uh, it might help if I can run a few benchmarks on my current server as well. Uh, so I found uh, Pharonix has a benchmarking suite that's uh, cross-platform. Ah, very nice. So, uh, like, I'm not I'm not exactly sure what all this does because I haven't actually tried it yet. So, uh, yeah, totally going to be uh, running this. It says they have let's see, 450 test profiles and over 100 test suites. Hmm. So it sounds like they have quite a bit of breadth of types of tests to run. Yeah. So, uh, like, I'll also probably be running, uh, was it OpenSSL? Uh, apparently that one has a, OpenSSL has a benchmark built in. So that'd be, uh, like, a pretty nice encryption kind of thing. And also maybe a single-threaded uh, benchmark as well. Uh, I looked, and uh, apparently it does have a multi-threaded option, but... Like, it's, as you would expect, it's all the same for, you know, every core. And, like, the way it displays it is, it hurts my brain. (laughs) (laughs) Like, you know, it just, like, spits out a whole bunch of numbers and stuff. And it's not exactly clear which which number is the result of what run. It's, yeah, it just hurts my head a lot. (laughs) Um but uh, some specific benchmarks might perform poorly if your internet connection absolutely sucks. It might be why your web experience sucks. Uh, so, like, we're talking about things like, uh, you know, like low-end uh, cell phone connections and dial-up. You know, uh, so this uh, this guy sort of goes on a rant saying, you know, if you think that a 56k connection is bad, try a 16k satellite connection from Ethiopia. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it, it pretty much goes on about, you know, again, like with web page bloat, uh, how, you know, it's only really good if you have a, you know, very fast connection with low latency, which, you know, it's something that you have to take into consideration for whatever audience you're building for. Mm -hmm. so you know again if you're building for people in africa that don't have uh very good internet connections you're going to you know have a very different set of choices than if you have a server in a basement in pittsburgh connected to fios one one uh kind of going along with that of your audience and choosing and building for them is they're talking about how say with a jquery request uh, the one page you looked at was kicking off like six of them at the same time. And so he's like, it's so slow. They're using up all the bandwidth and they're timing out because they're all collectively hogging too much for it to get done before it times out. Yeah. And so if you're building for that, though, then you say, okay, it's better to let one or two go at a time and get done rather than timing all of them out. Yeah, that's that's what I noticed back in the latter days of dial-up that uh, I was on mm-hmm. that, uh, just... you know, like some, some browsers were already starting to optimize for faster connections. Um, but I noticed that if I, uh, like configured the browser to only open up one connection at one time, that, uh, things would tend to load faster. So like, especially if you would like open up, uh, Let's see, uh, Internet Explorer did not have tabs way back in the day. (laughs) So, uh, but I would figure out a way to uh, open up additional uh, Internet Explorer browser windows. So that would sort of be like a poor man's tabbed browsing back in like 2001. I remember doing that. I clicked on the taskbar and then you had like 30 of them open. It's like, is that one downloading yet? (laughs) So like you'd... uh, you know, look at a forum, you know, and, you know, just start, you know, opening these threads. And by the time you reach the bottom of the page, the uh, first thread had reasonably loaded. And by the mm-hmm. time you got down with that one, all the others had finished loading. Yep. I, I remember those days. It's just, you go through and it's like, if I want to read that, you click on it now and then keep reading what you're reading because it's going to take a while. Yeah. So... Get it. Get the process going. Yeah, that's that's uh, what we call multitasking. Yeah, you know, uh, but it's it's sort of the idea of 
okay, the computer does something, I go away and do something else, like take a hike or something. Mm. The, the one interesting uh, thing that they had mentioned in the article was uh, this one guy from Google had done some optimizations to make like things load faster. Yeah, and I, I think what th- does it- I think I think we might have uh, mentioned this at some point that was uh, on YouTube that uh, you know he made a like a very lightweight YouTube uh, page that would you know load faster and then when he you know pushed it out did some A B testing on it and found out that this lighter page actually loaded slower on average than the heavier page and he looked at it and found out that. You know, it was like people from Africa and Siberia <laughs> and Latin America, you know, watching YouTube videos on this. Like, well, it actually works now. Yeah. On this lighter page that, you know, uh, can only that will load for them in about a minute or two, uh, which sounds bad. But before it was like a five minute wait to load. So, uh, yeah, it turns out that, you know, if you make a lighter page. Uh, on a very heavily trafficked site, word gets around. Which is very interesting that uh, people figured that out and take advantage of it. Yeah, but, uh, you know, maybe maybe you're on such uh, a crappy cell phone connection. Uh, you know, most most of those data connections are at least serviceable, but apparently you need to uh, need one to unlock your Tesla from your phone. Apparently... This unlock feature does not use any kind of local connectivity like Bluetooth, and both the phone and car must have reception. Uh, so this was, uh, uh, how should I say, a very uh, expensive lesson, I guess you could say, uh, as in terms of like time and surprises and stuff, that you know someone in Las Vegas. You know, decides to you know go up in the mountains and look at the snow and you know pick, take some pictures or something, and uh, it's like because uh, you know his car can uh, be unlocked from his phone, that you know I don't need to take my keys, so he goes up into the mountains where there is no cell phone connection, and whoops, he's locked out of his car, so he uh, needs to you know he. Uh, finally went to a place that had some kind of reception and he had to call his wife to, you know, tell her to get the key and come up here to the middle of nowhere because I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> See, they were kind of talking about like, so the solution is like, you really should take your keys and it kind of comes down to the cell phone. Well, nice. Unless they make it. So it works uh, off the grid. You really need a safety protection there that says, well, if you don't have your keys, I'm sorry, but we're not going to let you uh, go leave your house or something. Like, you should have your key before you leave your house and just make them bring their keys with them. So, yeah, for now, smartphone-based keyless entry systems seem more of a handy backup than a always reliable primary unlocking technique. So, in most cases, Tesla can also remotely unlock your car. But when there's no key and no service, there's little the company can do. So uh, going back to, uh, you know, buying a new computer and stuff, uh, it seems like gaming hardware needs to grow up uh, because uh, it seems these days that uh, gaming stuff uh, is, how should I say, it looks like a transformer, (laughs) you know, uh, like the cartoons. So... Mm -hmm. You know, personally, I don't want my stuff looking like it has enough parts and that it glows so much that it could be mistaken for a nuclear reactor. <laughs> so See, That is definitely a trend I've noticed over the years is the gaming stuff always has to look look like the games that people play, basically, is what it comes down to, flashy and showy. They must be playing very different games than I do. So, uh... You know, even for instance, you know, I've been playing a lot of Witcher 3 and Fallout 4 and none of my games look like any of these products. It <laughs> doesn't have even the same veneer. None of them had like a headphone case thing that, that they had the big blue double spike things to set your headphones on. Uh, no design like that anywhere. So uh, case in point, 
I have two of those blank keyboards pictured in the article. So yes, I remember you told me you got your work one. Yeah. I... So, um, you know, I, I showed it to people when I initially got it and, uh, they kind of looked at me funny, I guess. Uh, so what's, I was going to say, what's going to be interesting is when uh, someone comes to your desk sometime and has to type on your keyboard and they're going to like not be able to do it. Uh, that hasn't even happened with my old keyboard and I've been there for several years. So, okay. Uh, I mean, you know, maybe by getting the keyboard, I had the possibility of getting jinxed like the next day. Uh, but that, <laughs> but that didn't happen either. So, okay. So, uh, the uh, editor uh, that wrote the uh, the article uh, also apparently commented at some point, and he said, "Don't get me wrong, I'm all for choice, but I'd wager that there is less choice in recent times, as everything gaming is going in this direction. If someone wants simplistic gaming, their choices are fewer than those who want more exaggerated ex- uh, appearances." This isn't about taste as it is manufacturers saying gaming must look crazy. Appearances do not make gaming. What the companies are doing is saying that if you want gaming, you'll need to pick from our selection selection of transformer looking devices. They're telling the customer that exhibit A is gaming, when in fact it has nothing to do with gaming. I'm not asking for less choice, I'm asking for more. So, uh, moving on here, uh, we haven't really talked uh, a whole lot about neural networks on this podcast, uh, mostly because they seem to be a whole bunch of voodoo, Uh, but apparently they have a somewhat useful application, colorization of old photos. So, uh, we were just talking about this on the fringe here. Uh, and you know, as noted, it really notices like what is grass and it always colors it very green. Uh, but it is not quite as accurate for other things. So it, it thinks all animals are brown. Yeah. Uh, so I guess it sort of apparently grass is a very easy texture to pick up on. So like it says, oh, this sort of this pattern of, you know, black and white looks like grass. So I'm going to color all this green. And then uh, like I'm looking at the, the bench one here. It's like, yeah, benches are usually made out of, like, uh, wood. So I'm going to color this a nice sort of tan wood color. Which, that bench one actually looks appropriate, right? Yes. That's, that If I was didn't know what it would look like in real life, I might actually have picked that brownish color. Because, as you said, bench, wood, yeah, that's kind of like what it might be. And then uh, with the real photo, it's, like, blue or purple or something. That almost looks as just like exposure of the camera in real life. It might actually still look the brown color. Yeah. And like, uh, like the building in the background also looks very blue as well. Exactly. But, uh, that, that's the real photo in the, uh, the neural networked photo, the, the guess photo. It looks okay. Yeah. You know, granted, uh, some, at some portions, like it sort of forgot to color things. To me, that's, if you don't, if you don't know what to do, it's better to uh, to not so much guess and not wreck the photo, I guess. Right. Which I, I feel like he's done pretty good mo- overall. Like sometimes the certain patterns get mistaken for grass. It seems like the the kid with the the shirt, and you can kind of see some green on his shirt, and it well it must be his shirt looks like grass, so it must right. be green. But overall, it does pretty so good. So this this particular one, uh, you know, apparently the idea with neural networks is that you know you you know give it some input and then you tell it, I want it to look like this. I want the output to look like this, and then somehow it figures it out. And uh, uh, let's see, he uh, got a data set that was like 147 gigabytes of. 1.2 million images. So this uh, particular one uh, downscales the image to 224 pixels on each side. So like pretty small. Um, so and then it like runs through a uh, was it a GeForce GTX 750 Ti graphics card. 
Uh, so he said that uh, it seemed like the GPU memory uh, was the limitation here. Uh, but, you know, if you had more uh, GPU memory, then uh, apparently you could process a bigger photo. So and then uh, uh, apparently Reddit also has one of these uh, colorization uh, deep neural networks as well. And it seems to do a little better, actually. So the uh, the one surprise on that one is like that uh, mountain lake with all the steam coming off of it. It yes. apparently didn't realize that that's supposed to be green. But then again, if you did not know, uh, like volcanic lakes being green from the algae, uh, you would probably color it blue. Yeah, because if you've seen lots of water before, it's like, well, what color is water? Uh, blue. So you're going to pick the blue. Well, then again, like pictures of mountain lakes are generally blue because it reflects the sky, I think. So even for the location in general, that was a pretty fair guess on its part. Yeah. You know, like whenever you, you know, visualize a lake up in the mountains, like it's generally like just this deep blue color. So then, uh, you know, again, it shows uh, some more uh, uh, attempted colorization. And uh, it sometimes gets freaky around the edges of some of these photos, like this the last one with a guy holding the skull. Uh-huh. Like, like this whole red blotch creeps in from the side. Which is funny. I was just thinking about that. I've seen that red blotch show up in old film photos before. I've seen that same exposure thing happen to them. Yeah. I'm wondering if there's some relationship there. Yeah. Like if you trained it on images that didn't have that, maybe it would not put that in there. Ah, that could be. Yeah. So, and I... Again, you can sort of see, you know, how, uh, like the picture of that kid, uh, just above that, uh, the skull one, Mm -hmm. like you can see like the legs of his pants, like his pant legs are different colors. (laughs) One's a blue and the other one's kind of like a brown. (laughs) See, I'm actually missing which kid you're talking about. The one with the, like the yellow shirt on that's standing there in the grass? Uh, no, it's the... uh it's the fourth one up from the skull, the oh, one above the dog. Above the dog. Oh, okay. I was looking at the wrong photo. See, t- to me, that that color, that photo didn't even really come out very. That's more like a what's it called? Septa or sepia? Or, is, is, sepia. Okay, thank you. I've seen it printed, but not really heard it. Okay, so this is kind of a sepia type of photo. It's just like a red hue. You can't really see the colors that super good. Yeah. But I do see it has like a streak down his pant leg. Is that what you're talking about there? Well, well, the the pant legs are different colors there. Yeah, but uh, you know, I think I think sepia photos would not be too bad because you could just put those into grayscale and then work from mm. there. Oh, you're saying to go from that to color? Yeah, that's probably true. So, and then I wonder if it realizes, you know, like what decade this is from. And then tries to, you know, work from that. Like, oh, the styles are were kind of like this back then. So, like, you can kind of, like, fill that in almost. I don't know. Yeah, that's true. You, you would really want to do that. Because there are, like, we were talking, I think it was in the pre-show, we were talking about that just the different eras have kind of different intensities of color. Like, when they developed the film, like, it was a different preference of how, how the color looks. Even past 20 years of I flip through like photo albums and stuff I can see it how they colored photos has changed over time right so uh, let's uh, do some appreciate and I would like to appreciate putty the uh, the SSH client for Windows uh, specifically but it looks like it also uh, uh, you can also download it for Unix as well uh, but uh, they just released 0.68 so uh go and download that now the uh at least for the big change for me is that it supports uh i think it's 255 19 uh type keys so like you can uh do the uh public key cryptography with these 255 19 keys uh and then uh yeah because i've I've been using these for a while now, and I've been using a 
uh, like a nightly snapshot of Putty, and mm-hmm. like it seemed to have worked pretty well. Uh, but yeah, this is like the first major release after that's been implemented. So, and it you know of course has uh, uh, another boatload of fixes as well. So uh, I wonder when the uh, the Windows version of OpenSSH is going to come. Uh, so, like I'm really curious about that if it'll allow you to mount SFTP shares as drives. That would, that would be, be kind of nice. That would be a killer feature. Uh-huh. So, uh, we haven't see. really heard too much about Windows 10. Like, like, it seems to be a fairly quiet other than the whole update problems. Um, yeah, the uh, creator's update is coming. So that's... Uh, uh, like, I've been seeing things here and there about it, but nothing that's particularly caught my eye. Mm. So, uh, let's see. If you'd, if you'd like to send feedback to the show, uh, go ahead and do that uh, from the show notes page, and that'll come directly to our spam folders, which I do check. So I'm, I'm actually not getting hardly any spam anymore. So that's <laughs> gr- I guess that's great. Go so- Google. So, and don't forget that today is International Backup Awareness Day. So back up all your stuff to your SFTP shares and then back those up further to like an external hard drive or something. And that seems to be it for the show. Um, anything else you'd like to add? Uh, not really. Pretty much uh, I looking forward to eating a rabbit here one of these days that I got this last weekend. So I was good to made it out for hunt- some hunting here in this good warm weather. Hoping it doesn't snow too bad. I'm actually planning on traveling next week, going out to Harrisburg to see a, uh, a horse show. It's kind of like a, a talk. It's about different horse stuff. So, uh, see how that goes. So, oh yeah, and I totally forgot that I uh, had a cookout uh, last Friday. Uh, so yeah, Chris and uh, uh, Matt came over, and uh, yeah, I was sort of hoping you'd uh, you know come down this week. So it was like, yeah, I have like all these leftovers. I'm going to be eating them for a week at least. So yeah, so I ended up I had the meeting. We left at like eight o'clock or something like that. Oh, that oh late. wow, that was like really late. Yeah, like, it was late. Like I was thinking like maybe six or maybe seven o'clock late, but eight. Wow. Yeah, had we got done sooner, it could have worked out. So. Yeah. That's why I figured it was just best to plan on being later and it was as I thought. All right, that sounds good. So have a good one. You too.